Hello and welcome to a new tour of this space, the place where all the, the non-humans live. Uh, I haven't done one of these in so long. The last one I did was in, I think, 2017. So we're back, we're talking about this whole thing again. And yeah, since that video, so much has changed. Uh, everything is in a completely new space, in case that wasn't obvious, everything's been moved for various uh, logistical reasons. Um, and it's all resulted in a brand new space for the animals, for the reptiles. And uh, it's looking great up here. So as you can see on this wall we have uh, all the larger enclosures, so we have four of these. I think these are like 3 by 2 by 2 vision cages, or maybe like 3 by 2 by 18 inches or something like that. And then on this wall we have a stack of four, um, I think these are just 2 by 2 by 1s, or something, something close to that. I don't remember the exact measurements. Uh, still with vision cages, that's how I house everything. Uh, they're good, they have their problems, mainly the, the gaps uh, beneath and below the, the metal pieces. Um, the tracks for the, the sliding doors, they create little grooves where smaller snakes can hide and bigger snakes can actually get stuck in, and it's uh, it's not really ideal, uh, but it, it could be worse. Uh, over here we have all the, the functional uh, cleaning things and other supplies and feeding supplies and rubber scrapers for prying open mouths and, and aluminum tape because you just, you need that. Uh, we are depressingly low on paper towel. <laughs> And of course, with the current uh, global situation, that's that's a rare commodity. <laughs> oh, and I almost forgot to mention that today I will be joined by my lovely, lovely co-host Penny, who's uh, just gonna hang around on the floor because uh, that's all she does. Okay, so the first animal we're gonna look at is actually the newest animal in the room. Uh, yeah, this guy was here for the last tour, and he was like a teeny tiny baby. He was just out at the front, looking all curious, like he wanted to come out. And then I went in and I, I fixed his branch, which he had knocked over, and now he's he's hiding again. So I'm going to remove these because he'll totally grab onto them. So this is the jungle carpet, uh, Blaze. He is, see, he was born in 2015, so he's going to be five soon. And his temperament is improving so much, and he's becoming one of my favorite snakes to work with. Uh, hello buddy! Uh, he's sort of holding on to some aspen. Uh, amazing. Anyhow, um, ah, there we go. Uh, he's an absolutely beautiful snake. Uh, he's just a normal, but he's got a, quite a few generations of really good genetics behind him. So he has very high contrast, and he's very, very curious about the camera. Um, Youngest snake in the room, like I said, uh, he was very nippy and anxious and just kind of not the greatest snake to handle for quite a while, but in recent months and really over the past year, he's been calming down a lot more and I've been handling him a lot more, and his temperament is really improving, and he's kind of just a joy to hang out with now. Yes, hello, hello, yes, that is a camera. Oh, oh, hi. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. I see that you just want to be out in the room. Oh, dear. So below Blaze is uh, one of the most interesting species I keep, probably the least common. Uh, I think they're becoming a little more well-known, but they're still not a super common snake to see around. Wow. Come on, there we go. Sorry, mic is slipping off. I literally rubber band my mic to the top of my camera because we're very high tech around here, in case you couldn't tell. So anyhow, this is my black milk snake, uh, Drusilla. She is absolutely gorgeous. She's my favorite colubrid I have. Uh, the only other colubrids I have are corn snakes, so maybe she doesn't have the greatest of competition, but just look at that. Uh, she's very, very chill. So. I'm sorry that she's not moving very much. Here, let's, there's her head. You can actually kind of see it there. Um, yeah, beautiful snake. They start out, of course, with the red, white, and black triads, like most milk snakes have to some extent, just the typical kind of patterning for that whole species. And then slowly they get darker with every shed and completely darken down to pure black as adults. And it's absolutely stunning and 
she's just such a cool snake. And like I said, she's very chill, and colubrids I tend to think of as being very hyperactive, very quick, wiggly snakes that don't love handling. Even corn snakes, despite being one of the most common beginner species, can be so fast moving and so delicate as babies, and she was very wiggly as a baby, but at some point these guys just get so calm, and now this is what she does. She's like the ball python of colubrids. It's a really cool, kind of different type of animal to keep, and I just absolutely love her. She's fantastic. For the next snake, I'm gonna need two hands, because he is by a decent margin the biggest snake in the room, although he's still a fairly moderate size compared to actual big snakes. Uh, this is Oz the Brazilian Rainbow Boa. Uh, Y'all know Brazilian Rainbow Boas most likely, so he doesn't need that much of an introduction. Of course one snake decided to be in shed for this video, uh, and of course it also happens to be one of the most beautiful species of snake in the room, so that's a bit unfortunate. Uh, he's certainly not at his full uh, glory, I suppose. Uh, but anyhow, here he is. He is quite an awesome lad. This is, this is one of my favorite snakes I have. I, I love Oz. He's just so cool. He's got an interesting personality. He can be kind of hyper. Today he appears to be in more of the hyper mood. Uh, but it's never, it never has any sort of feeling of nervousness. He always just feels like he wants to explore and well, right now it seems like he wants to go back to his hidey hole, but, you know, he just seems like a really curious snake, he's really active, he's clearly one of the smarter snakes in the room, I would guess, although it's hard to judge that stuff. Um, and he's just really fun to work with, uh, he's bitten me a couple times out of defense and, like, fe feeding response as well, uh, but, but literally only a couple times, and that's great, because I feel like Rainbow Boas still have a bit of a reputation uh, as to their temperament, I think a lot of people still think they have kind of a a sketchy or aggressive temperament? I don't think so at all. He's one of the most docile snakes in the room. He's bitten me no more than my original snake, my first snake, my ball python, Drake had. Um, and everyone trusts ball pythons, so quite frankly, yeah. Maybe I just got lucky, but he has a wonderful, per a wonderful personality. And uh, he's just so beautiful to look at, and he's just a cool snake in general to work with. He's one of my favorites to get out for people because he's fairly impressive. He's at a great size where He's still really easy to handle, but he is big enough that, especially someone who doesn't know snakes well, looks at him and goes, Whoa, that's a big snake! Um, and that's really cool. So, I'll let him go back now because he's probably uncomfortable because he's slowly becoming opaque, although he's not quite um, completely blue yet. Um, but yeah, anyhow, that is Oz. How are you doing? Are you good? You seem good. <laughs> The next snake in the room is, in my opinion, the absolute best to keep. And I don't just mean of the snakes I have, I mean I'm, I could be wrong because I only keep a few species, but so far this is my favorite animal to work with uh, in the whole household at the moment. Uh, this is Griffin, he is a Brettles python or a Centralian python or a uh, Central Carpet Python, Central Australian Carpet Python. There's a lot of common names, although Brettles python is probably the most common. Uh, but Morelia breadli is, of course, the genus and species. And this is just, oh my goodness, come here, buddy. I'm gonna move your hide back to where it belongs. Yeah. When people ask me, hey, what's a good snake that's really bulletproof, really easy to care for, hardy in captivity, something that can work for a beginner, uh, but is a little more exotic and unique than, say, a ball python or a corn snake, I always direct them to Brettles pythons. Uh, very closely related to carpet pythons and green tree pythons, those other Morelia genus Australian constrictors. So they have all the same kind of cool aspects that those snakes do in terms of head shape and body proportions, patterns, temperament. Uh, but in terms of temperament, this guy is way friendlier than your average carpet python, and that's another great thing that makes them a good uh, beginner to intermediate snake in my opinion, is because they are obviously a little bit quick moving, 
Uh, not as quick as a colubrid, but they have an exploratory kind of personality, or at least Griffin does. It's a very curious snake, very smart snake. Um, but they're not wiggly, they're not hard to handle, and I've never been bitten by him. Not once. And he has an insane feeding response, but he's never mistaken me for food, he's never bitten out of defense. And you compare that to a carpet python, a proper carpet python, or especially a green tree python, and, you know, those animals are certainly getting better in terms of temperaments, uh, uh, the more their captive populations are established. Um, but these guys are just way more docile right off the bat, and very beautiful. Some of them are very dark, almost black. Some of them are very red and russet colored. Um, Griffin is somewhere in between. He's fairly typical coloring, or he has fairly typical typical coloring for a Brettles python. And don't don't go up there. Um, I'm I'm gonna let him back into his enclosure here. But yeah, just a fantastic snake. A uh, second longest snake in the room, um, possibly the second heaviest. Although um, there's another one that that rivals him in terms of weight. Um, which we'll get to next. And <laughs> are you okay, buddy? Okay, I think I think he's got a good grip. We're gonna we're gonna let him go chill for now. next snake is the one and only ball python in the room. There used to be two ball pythons in the house. Uh, I already referenced my first snake, which was Drake the ball python. Uh, he has passed away uh, far earlier than I would have expected or wanted, considering he was a healthy adult ball python, and they have quite impressive lifespans for being such a common snake. I think people often forget that their lifespan is uncommonly long, uh, going all the way up to, I think, 42 years is the record. That's quite a lot. Um, Drake, unfortunately, though, had lymphoma, actual cancer, which is something I think we sort of forget that reptiles can actually have, but sure enough, that happened, and there were other issues that were stemming from it, uh, and other issues that may have not even been related to it. This is Squeak. Uh, she was the rescue ball python who I featured in previous content back on my YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, when she came to us, she was tiny, she was starving, she was stunted, and now she's quite large, and she's put on some impressive weight. She looks fantastic. She's not quite as big as I personally think an adult ball python of her age should be. Um, she's gonna be turning 11 this year, so yeah, she could be a lot bigger, but considering her past and where she came from, I'm just so happy. This is one of our most successful rehabilitation uh, attempts and uh, Pe Penny being the other most successful one. Um, and she's upside down, that's great. The next snake we're gonna look at here, we're very close to the end of this video. It's already gone on way too long considering that there's only seven animals in the room. Uh, but that's just how I operate. <laughs> that happens every time I film one of these. Um, so this is Phoenix, the Amel Corn. Oh, you left me a present in the back. She left me a spicy meatball, guys. Uh, anyhow, uh, Phoenix is a fantastic little snake. I'm just going to bring her out and let her crawl around on the floor for a bit, I think. Um, she is just the healthiest most tenacious corn snake. She's actually being really chill right now, but typically she's one of my most active exploring type snakes I have. Uh, she's very quick moving. Uh, very, oh dear, well, kind of shy today. Um, but anyhow, uh, yeah, she's just a fantastic snake. She bit me like a hundred times as a baby, which is just awesome because corn snakes are normally known for being placid. And she was just fiery and feisty from the start. Uh, and it's resulted in a very healthy adult animal. She just has a uh, I guess a great constitution, if you want to use that type of terminology that applies to snakes, sure. And uh, yeah, she's uh, gorgeous. Uh, I'm trying to think how I can best show this. I guess I'll just pick her up and turn her upside down. But her belly pattern is very unique. She has this sort of orange and white kind of checkerboarding on the top half of her body. And then on the bottom half, it just fades out to like this consistent sort of marbled pink and orange. Uh, and it, yeah, you can see there her back half and front half, uh, the back half and front half of her underside have completely different colors and patterns, and I love that. I don't, I don't know if that's common for Amel corns. It doesn't seem like it is. Um, so that's quite a unique 
traits, and where are you going? So the final snake that we're going to talk about today is Lethal Yellow, my male butter striped corn. One of my favorite snakes I have. He's, I feel like I forget about him, but he's just so cool. Uh, butter stripe, um, not the most common morph, not the most difficult to find or pay for either, but just a cool morph that I feel like doesn't really get highlighted all that often. Now, unfortunately, he is currently, of course, the one snake battling some sort of health issue. And I say of course because, for whatever reason, he's always the one snake in the room who seems to be battling some sort of health issue. Thankfully, something much more minor than the, the lymphoma, uh, the cancer I mentioned regarding Drake earlier. <laughs> much, much more minor. Currently, it is this odd... I gotta get behind the lens so I know I'm actually showing you. This odd discoloration under his head. Yeah, you can see that. Uh, the scales underneath his head, I won't hold him like that for too long since he clearly doesn't like it. Uh, but yeah, they're just sort of stained brown and they're a bit odd looking and just it's a few patchy little areas under his under his chin, I guess. Um, my first thought, of course, seeing something like that is that scale rot that's developing at some sort of stage. But, well, first off, scale rot doesn't just come out of nowhere. It's typically husbandry related. And also, if you're not doing anything about it, it's going to continue to spread and progress and get worse. But he lives in the exact same super simple bulletproof setup that his perfectly healthy neighbor Phoenix does. Uh, it did come out of nowhere. Literally one day he had completely clear white perfect scales underneath his head and the next day this was there looking exactly as it does now. And third of all, uh, as you probably just inferred by me saying that it looked exactly the same then as it does now, uh, it hasn't changed at all. It is completely static, it's not getting worse, it's not getting better, it's just sedentary where it is. And the other thing, the other important factor, is that I actually think I know exactly what caused this. Uh, not too long ago he actually had paper towel in this setup instead of aspen because I was still in the process of uh, transitioning over all my animals to uh, loose bedding instead of paper. I'm just like ADD with that stuff, I'm always switching back and forth, although with the pandemic, uh, probably a good decision to go back to loose bedding and not use paper towel for a while. But anyhow, uh, when he had paper towel in here, he had dragged it through his water bowl, spilled water everywhere, made this whole swamp in the corner of his cage, and then pooped in it and spread the poop around. There's just this brown, poopy swamp sludge zone all around his water bowl. Just standing brown water. It was a glorious, disgusting sight to behold. Anyhow, I went over to clean it the day he did it, and he was wedging his head in between his water bowl and the floor of his cage. He had like like aggressively like pinched and stuck his face down under his water bowl in the midst of the brown poop sludge. So I'm assuming then that this discoloration and this weird affliction going on to the scales underneath his head is some combination of staining, uh, gross self-injury, and irritation to the scales in that area with, I suppose, a minor potentiality for infection, but I'm not too worried about that at the moment. I'm really not too worried about this in general, mainly because all the main health behavioral things to look at with snakes are all great with him. He's super alert and active. His eyes are bright and responsive. His tongue is flicking constantly. He's still eating, so that's a massive, you know, positive sort of behavioral thing. Uh, yeah, I'm literally just in the watch and wait phase with it. So that is it for this video. We've gone through everything. That's the room, and that's what the setup is like. There's Penny being Penny as usual. That's all she does all day, every day. Uh, anyhow, yeah. Thank you very much for watching. I want to do more content related to my animals as time progresses in future weeks and months. And um, yeah, this was really fun to actually be able to show off this new space because I'm really excited about it and it's just really enjoyable to actually be working with my animals in like a nice area and not a violently green tiny room in the back of the house where they used to be. So anyhow, thank you for watching. I will see you all next time.